today, and so is my guest. And we're going to talk about something that I know very little about. In fact, if you want advice in this area, I am probably the last person that you want to you want to ask. I, I just I have not been good at finances in my life, and I I wish I was a great investor, which is perfect for today's guest. His name is Richard Everett. This is his book, How to Be a Great Investor. And the subtitle I find interesting, I'm definitely going to have to ask him about this, and it's Investment Techniques for Christians. And my mind goes, what's the difference between investing for Christians and non-Christians? And we'll, we'll get to that. But uh, Richard Everett, he's been in finance for years. He's spoken to uh, countless people. Um, he's, he's done it all. Uh, he's done radio. He's done books. I mean, this is someone who has a history of telling you uh, things that can be very complex in a very simple way that you can understand. And that's why I, I think this will benefit you, especially as we move into some uh, questionable times and, and watching. I, I have no idea what's going to happen uh, economically in this country over the next few years. It scares me a little bit. So we're going to get some answers. Richard, thank you for being with me today on Life Today Live. You're welcome. My pleasure. So before we get into some of my questions and my fears and my ignorance, <laughs> I want to know a little bit about you. I'm curious why, you know, is this something you just thought, hey, I'll get an investing, it'll be a fun job. Uh, is there more to it than that? Well, investing is a fun job uh, if you know what you're doing. Uh, you can reap the benefits of it. But uh, I actually have a, I, I consider it to be a fairly interesting uh, testimony. Back in the early 80s, uh, I went through a business failure. I was in medical sales and owned a fairly large company. Uh, we went broke. And it was that simple. Recession came along. Uh, I didn't have enough money saved. I didn't, hadn't planned properly. I had to lay 30 people off, which was heart wrenching. Uh, and my bottom line is that I had no money. I mean, I literally had $5 in a savings account. So I didn't have a job. I didn't have a business. I didn't have any income. And things got so bad for us during that period of time. Uh, we'd have the bill collectors calling every day. We'd have sheriffs knocking on the door trying to collect. Uh, and one day uh, I'm walking down the stairs and my wife said to me, what are, going to, what are we going to feed the children today? because we have now run out of food. And I turned my back so she couldn't see me cry, but I said to her, the Lord will provide. And I honestly believe that. Um, and ironically, she went out for a while with the kids and about two hours later, somebody rang our doorbell and they said, are you Richard Everett? And I said, yeah, and he pulled out a hundred dollar bill out of a shirt pocket. It's a complete stranger. I've never seen you before. And he goes, the Lord brought me to your house and said he needed this today. And that was a true miracle uh, to help, you know, going back to the 80s, $100 five months worth of groceries. So God did indeed provide. But what, what triggered um, my entrance into the world of finance was that I realized that I, from a financial point of view, I was a complete failure. It was my fault we went out of business. Uh, so I decided to take the Bible and read it from cover to cover and highlight everything the Bible had to say about money, finances, and stewardship. And uh, I still have that Bible with all those highlighted. And I realized that God has a lot to say about money, stewardship, and finances. We, we tend to, when we become Christians, uh, try to tend to shy away from that. But there's a lot uh, in the Bible about how we're supposed to handle money. So that triggered uh, that and some... Uh, um, influence from a couple of pastor friends of mine, a couple of friends of mine said, Richard really should get into this arena, which I thought was hysterical because here I am a business failure going into the area of investing and financing, but God, God does have a sense of humor. And I did start my career in December of 1984. And we ended up over the 25 years that I had owned my own firm, building one of the largest independent investment firms uh, in the country. And, um, you know, folks got to know my testimony. And uh, we were able to help a lot of Christians invest their money over over that period of time. So I'm I'm guessing that most people watching right now are more like you then than they are now. And they're thinking, okay, 
I'm watching this thing on investment, but I got nothing to invest. What are some of the first steps to get into a position where we can even consider investment? Because honest to God, most people are just trying to put food on the table like you were. I think the first thing is to get your financial house in order. Um, yeah, put a budget together. Uh, one of the best pieces of advice I got were from a Christian businessman going back to the 80s. I had the opportunity to meet him, meet with him. And I asked him, give me your best piece of advice. And he said, Rich, it's pretty simple. He says, live below your means. Not live within your means, live below your means. And this is a gentleman that was on the Forbes 400 richest people in America. And I thought that was terrific advice. Uh, and I've counseled dozens and dozens of people in our church uh, over the years. And, and it's a matter of setting priorities. Do you really need to spend money on this? Do you really need to spend money on that? And, and put a priority list together. See what you can cut. Get those bills paid off. Credit cards can charge anywhere from 15 to 20, 25% interest. Get those paid off first. Uh, and get, get your financial house in order. I wrote a book. And it's ancient now. It's called uh, Whatever Happened to the Promised Land. And uh, it, it talks about how to put a budget together and how to get your financial house in order. But that's number one, because you can't invest unless you have any money. I, and that, I think that's where most people, unfortunately, live. I know, honest, just full disclosure, that's where I've lived most of my life. It's like just trying to, to figure out how to get through this month and try to set up to do better next month. But for those who are in a position, well, let me ask you this. How much money do you need to have to invest? You can generally start an investment account in a mutual fund, for example. Uh, some mutual funds will accept as little as $25 a month if you set it up from your checking account. But candidly, the best way to invest, most people at work have some sort of retirement plan offered to them. A 403B, if you work for a school or a hospital or something, a, a municipality, 401k, most companies offer 401ks. Um, and you can set that up generally with your employer for as little as $25 a month. Now, people say, well, gee, what's $25 a month? The point is getting started now and allowing the time, time and compounding to work for you over a long period of time. I did a story. Uh, I'll do, share a quick story if it's okay with you. Yeah, sure. Uh, one of my clients, most of my clients are in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. Well, one of my clients sent me their daughter. And she came to see me reluctantly and she sat there kind of just looking at her nails and, you know, all that. And we chatted for a while. She goes, I don't have any money to invest. And I just asked her, I said, well, do you work? She goes, yeah. I said, do you have a 401k? Yeah. Do you, do you, do you participate in it? No. And I said, well, and she happened to have a Starbucks cup in her hand. I said, how much did that cost you? It was $4. And I said, well, why don't you take buy a can of coffee and invest that $4 a day? And I took my compound interest calculator while she was sitting there and the $4 a day, now she was only 25 years old, the $4 a day invested in a 401k and her company matched 50 cents on a dollar. I showed her that it would be worth over a million dollars by the time she was 65. I said, do you have any appreciation of how much that coffee is really costing you? Because again, it's a matter of resetting priorities. So, you can get started if it's, yeah. you know, if you look for an avenue to do so. What, so what do you do if you're my age and you were like that young girl? And uh, I mean, I was I was buying, I wasn't even drinking coffee and I still wasn't investing the $4 a day. What do you do later in life to, to catch up? Is there anything you can really do to kind of catch up? Yeah, yeah. Obviously you have to invest a lot more money, but you know, a lot of people say that. I don't have any money to invest, but again, if you, if you cut some things out or reprioritize or again, when I'm counseling folks, I just, you know, you only have three choices, either make more money. That means go out and get another part-time job, spend less money. That means cut things in your budget or sell assets. If you can, any assets that you might be able to sell and raise some money. And then you could start an investment account with, uh, with those dollars. Again, you don't have a lot of choices, but <laughs> the key is to get started now. Yeah. I put it off when someday right. I have money, someday when this happens, someday that happens. Yeah. Um, again, $25 a month. Most, most people can squeeze that out of the budget. I, I, I would honestly say that the biggest financial mistake I probably made was that type of thinking. Uh, and it's tough, man. I mean, when, you know, 
Sure. When you're raising, there were there there were literally times I couldn't afford the diapers that my wife's like, you don't have a choice, you know, and, yeah. and it's hard at that point to see how okay, yeah, I can cut a little bit out and invest a little bit. I, I do have one concern, uh, and because I'm in a better position now, obviously, finally getting all these kids out of the house that were sucking all the every penny out of me. Um, and great kids come after that, though. <laughs> to do what? Grandkids come after that. Though, yeah, they, yeah, uh, but they're easy. I think the concern right now, going forward, are the medical bills. But that's yeah. another topic. Here's my sure. question: um, are, are are we facing? Do you think? And I know you can't predict the future. I'm not asking you to predict the future, but how likely is it that we are about to hit a, such an inflationary period that those four dollars a day, or that, or that million dollars that you might have in 30, 40, 50 years ain't going to mean much. No, it's true, but it's going to mean more than nothing. Um, and yes, we, in all likelihood, are going to see some inflation. Uh, we saw that at the, the Fed minutes uh, last month. Uh, and it's, it's a simple reason. The government's spending a lot, a lot more money than it's taking in right now. So that will, and they're just printing a lot of money. I'm not suggesting that we go back to the Jimmy Carter days where we have 14, 15% inflation, but inflation has been pretty moot over the last three decades or so. Um, and, but it, we did see a slight spike and it's for simple reason. The government's giving away money to us to, to, to spend so we can stimulate the economy so they can tax us more. Um, but yeah, it, there's no way of knowing what the inflation rate is going to be by the time you retire or by the time uh, I retire. Um, but you know, there are investment vehicles that do keep pace with inflation. Well, okay. And that's, I think that's my next question because yeah, yeah, I can do the retirement, you know, account through my company, but right now the interest rates are so low that, that those aren't really generating a lot. Um, I mean, you got T-bills, you got the stock market, you've got, uh, annuities, real estate, uh, of course, if you watch a certain news channel, every other commercial is why I should buy gold. <laughs> you know, yeah. what uh, what do you think are the better investments uh, going forward? Well, um, there's, there's a couple different things you can do. First of all, you, you can buy real estate through a real estate investment trust, commonly known as REITs, R-E-I-T-S. Uh, and there are REIT mutual funds. And again, real estate will keep pace with inflation. Uh, you can generally open those uh, real estate investment trust mutual funds with $25 a month, $50 a month, $100 a month. So that, that would be one avenue. The other one is TIPS, T-I-P-S, that's uh, Treasury Inflation Protection Securities. Those are interesting. They pay almost nothing now, but you get an adjustment every year. So if inflation went up 1%, you get whatever the going rate uh, was for that prior year plus 1%. So it does keep pace with inflation no matter what the inflation rate is. And precious metals. Um, I've only used precious metals uh, once in my career for my clients, and that was after 9-11. Uh, you, use, you buy precious metals for two reasons, high inflation or political uncertainty. At least in my mind, 9-11 can still, uh, was certainly political uncertainty. And gold and silver funds actually went up over 100% over the next 18 months. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, now you the, the I went back to the subject by the way I'll tell people again we're talking to Richard Everett this is his book uh, How to Be a Great Investor and, and your subtitle there Investing Techniques for Christians um, what would be applicable to Christians that would be different than general financial investment advice but that's a great question um, I have been told by some of my peers that my book is a one of a kind if you will and the reason for that is before or very early in our married life, I actually got my degree in theology and I was a youth pastor for a short period of time. And so I have a background um, as a Christian. Uh, my wife and I got saved on our one year anniversary, wedding anniversary, and that was 44 years ago. So uh, Jesus and my wife and I are pretty good close friends over, over four decades. 
my point is that I have a Christian background, but I also have 25 years experience actually working in the investment arena. So when a, if a Christian wants to pick up a book on how to be a good investor, they're lacking. And what I mean by that is they can get a secular book. There's hundreds of secular books on how to invest. Each has their own point of view. Each has their ax to grind or their agenda to push. Um, and then you also have Christian books and most pastors that I know, or most ministers that I know aren't very good with money. That's not their calling. I don't say that as an insult, but that's not their calling. So they'll, uh, they'll talk about money from the pulpit or write a, a book about it, but it's strictly from a biblical point of view and doesn't really help you in a secular world we live in right now. So my point is that I have a great deal of experience from both. So I've been able to, to take them and, and meld them uh, together. Matter of fact, uh, one of the endorsements on my book said that uh, Richard provides ancient biblical wisdom and contemporary business insight go hand in hand and we ignore them at our own peril. This book is packed with practical insights. Actually, that was by Luis Palau. Um, and so the, I thought he brought it together quite well. You're taking biblical principles and you're also taking contemporary business and you're bringing them together. For practical, practical way to invest money today. Let me ask you this because you, you, you bring up the theological background. Um, and a lot of people's theology is God wants to bless me financially. And I just need to, you know, do this or do that so that God can bless me financially. But then they're terrible with money. <laughs> uh, have you seen? Hey, have you seen this? Is this if completely unfamiliar to you, or maybe you run across this? How do you think God's going to bless us if we don't understand His principles that He's laid out in the Scripture when it comes to handling finances? Sure. Yeah, this is not by no means a name it and claim it type of theology whatsoever. I I, I use the example. Um, I start off the book with the example of the parable uh, of the talents. And that was meaningful to me that going back when I was, didn't have any money at all and had, I told you I read the Bible from cover to cover, but that story in particular really resonated with me. Uh, and if I can refresh the, the listeners and uh, uh, memory is the Lord went away, but he gave one person five talents according to their ability gave one two talents according to their ability and gave another one one talent. And I'll paraphrase it, but uh, the Lord went away and the one with the five talents went out immediately. The key word is that it went out immediately and traded. Uh, and I use that as an example. Of, I, I think investing, trading uh, is certainly biblical. Um, and then the other two, the other one went out with the two talents and doubled them immediately and, and traded. And of course, the one did nothing and, and dug a hole in the world. I looked at that as saying, you know, I have a responsibility. God has given me not only talents on how to invest, but he's also given me money. And I'm responsible for that. I'm a steward. You know, uh, I'm supposed to do something with it. And, you know, the interesting thing about that, and I'm curious if you've really, you know, put a lot of thought into this, is that the, the one who buried the, the talent, and by talent, for those of you not familiar, it's a monetary unit of the time, the one who took his money and buried it didn't lose it. He didn't squander it. He didn't gamble it away. He didn't waste it. And when his master came back, he, he had what was given to him. What he didn't do was invest it and multiply it. And he wasn't just reprimanded he was called wicked and lazy yeah. that's really strong for someone who it's like god gave you this and hey when he came back i gave it right back most people would be like hey there's nothing to complain about here you know what you gave me i, I gave you back but it seems like like jesus is trying to tell us something that it's not just about protecting what i give you for when we're talking finances here it's about multiplication. Do yes, you see that? Yeah. Well, if you read that the whole story, and I, I, I certainly won't uh, take the time to do that, but the, the master said the least you should have done was put it in the bank. Again, I find that interesting. So if the least you can do is put it in the bank and get interest. Then the most you can do is what the other two did, went out and traded. 
how do you think it translates to to today? I mean, because we don't like trade like they did back then. Uh, is, is there any, oh. any specific kind of application that you draw out of that, or just as a matter of obedience and doing something? I think it's doing something. I, you know, it's funny. I, I went back and looked up the Greek and Hebrew words for the word traded, and it's very similar to the to the modern day of trading stocks or bonds or mutual funds or those types of things. And uh, I don't think anybody should do that unless they're comfortable doing it. So I'm not trying to twist anybody's arm and saying, but I, I think that the two uh, successful um, uh, the ones that had doubled the, the master's money did indeed go out and trade. They were, you know, buying and selling spices and, and, and other things. So you don't do that today. You do that through investment vehicles, which represent the same thing. Yeah, interesting. All right, I'm going to show you the website. This is uh, greatinvestor.org. You can get more from Richard Everett. You can see his book on the stock market and his book on how to be a great investor and got some videos, some more information. So if it's something you want to follow up with, uh, I would encourage you to do that. I will throw that URL into the chat for those of you that can see chat. Uh, and there is one chapter that I got I got to ask you about because when I read the title of this chapter, I laughed out loud, and, and it, it's nothing. Uh, I, I don't want to say anything negative, but you have a chapter called Ramsey versus Reality, and and I've met Dave Ramsey, very nice, and I know so many people that have benefited from just getting out of debt and getting their financial house in order, which you say is the first step towards being in a position to invest. Um, but yet, I do, I do know that sometimes I listen to Dave Ramsey on the radio, and I go, I, I, yeah, that sounds great, but I just, I, I, I can't do that. I, you know, what are you, what are you suggesting that is sort of beyond, beyond Ramsey, the, the next step, once you get your world cleaned up uh, and you get out of debt, what's next? Well, it's funny. Uh, um, I, I teach a small group in my church, and actually – my, I split my year between Connecticut and Florida, or at least I used to. So I would teach a small group up in Connecticut, teach a small group down in Florida. And um, so many of my students would say to me, you know, Dave Ramsey is awesome. He, he shows us how to get out of debt. He shows us how to put their financial house in order. He shows us all these things, uh, but he only takes us so far because he does not necessarily get into at least in my opinion, sound investment advice. So you know, I can actually quote from his website, uh, go out and buy a good mutual fund. Well, that's candidly from my perspective as an investment advisor, how do you define good? Um, so uh, I love it because I paired up with uh, one of the guys in our church who's a CPA and he's taught the Ramsey course in our church. So he teaches them and brings, shows them how to get out of debt. And then the next semester they come into my class and I show them how to invest that money. That is a logical next step. So I've actually been encouraged to uh, write that chapter for I saw my students. Again, their comment was Ramsey only takes us so far. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, and again, that's uh, the first step. So, I mean, I, I think if you're trying to get, you know, your finances or trying to figure some things out, um, that's a good one to punch. So get some different sources, get some different views, yeah. and, and certainly Richard has the the background and the experience and the track record to be someone you can listen to. Let me ask you this because this is coming up a lot lately, and unfortunately, uh, in some ways, it it just I kind of hate it. But politics is is like invest. It's just got its tentacles in everything where it shouldn't, including the financial world. Um, so, but at the same time, here's. Here's my concern. If, if there, okay, great example. Recently, um, you know, they moved the major league ball game from from Georgia to uh, from Atlanta to Denver, and you have all these companies coming out and making false statements. Delta Airlines, I think, was guilty of it. Coca Cola, I believe, was guilty of it. Literally making false statements, and that was more of a political matter. As Christians who are putting money into a mutual fund, should we? Should we invest according to whether a company is, is upholding godly values? And the political, okay, but there are some companies that support abortion, you know, that support the things that are just straight up unscriptural. Um, 
Yeah, of course. Liquor. I, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about supporting the, you know, the, the changing boys into girls at young ages kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, how, how much should that play into how we invest? Well, it, it depends on the investor, the Christian investor's conscience of whether or not that's important to them or not. Um, believe it or not, to some people, it's not important. Other people, um, you can you can invest in, or you can do your own research, first of all, and, and find individual stocks and find out uh, what they do and do not support. But the easiest way, are there are, there are mutual funds that are called socially conscious. And there are actually one, and might be even two, that do it from a religious point of view as well. So you do not uh, support anybody that supports those types of issues. Uh, and all you have to do is Google, Google socially conscious mutual funds and you'll get a whole list of them. So yeah, there's an avenue to do that. Okay. Well, that's good to know. I mean, yeah, because I wouldn't, I, I don't know that I would be comfortable putting my money into something that's supporting abortion, for example. Of course. You know? um, all right. So I, I, you've, you've, Given us a good broad overview, is there anything that we're, that we're missing that people really need to know that will position them to be in a position to invest, but also to be a good investor? Well, I'll give you a couple quick takeaways. Mm -hmm. um, one of the one of the um, principles that's biblical, by the way, this is one to answer your earlier question. One of the things that I brought in from the Ecclesiastes, Solomon said, invest in seven ventures. Yes, in eight. For you do not know what disaster may come upon the, the land. And uh, I, I take that as diversification and investing. It's if you're going to not, unlike Mr. Ramsey, who wants you to put all your money in four different mutual funds, which are all stock, you're putting all your assets in one, one, uh, uh, one type of investment. But I, I like to go with Solomon's advice, go with seven or eight. So you can invest in stocks, bonds, real estate investment trust, you can do treasuries to see you can spread that risk around so that we have events like COVID because the market got crushed right after that last October. Fortunately, it's rebounded, but 9-11 or the mortgage debacle in 2007, 2008, when you hit those types of events, they are inevitable uh, to happen. At least you spread your risk out and uh, lowered your volatility. So that would be one thing. The second takeaway, which uh, I, I hammer in the book, is that your success as an investor is directly proportional to the price that you pay for your investment. Think about buying uh, something at full price versus on sale. And I use an example of Yahoo in there. In the year 2000, Yahoo was trading at over $100 a share. One year later, it was trading at $11 a share. So if you bought it at 100, look at all the money you lost. If you bought it at 11, you actually uh, made uh, over 500% uh, two years after that. So same company, it's the price that you pay. So you have to be very careful to make sure you're buying uh, at a lower price, at a bargain price. Buy low, sell high. Um, there you I, go. Close down to. I, I as, as, uh, as awful as my, yeah, as awful as my financial history has been, <laughs> I did when COVID hit. Uh, I, I bought some cruise line stocks that just were so cheap. I was like, hmm, put a little bit towards this. And I don't mean very much. But you know what? More than double my money. Unless there I, you know, know. Yeah. If I could just pull it off again. Uh, so uh, la last question. Lo lottery tickets, good investment or bad investment? <laughs> <laughs> I forgot what the odds are off the top of my head, but it's like one in 100 million. So, you know, if you're feeling lucky and you want to waste your money, uh, no, you could take that same money. I'll go back to people say they can't find money to invest, but I spend ten dollars a week on lottery tickets. <laughs> Jeez, something's wrong there. You have your priorities out of whack. Yeah, I was ten dollars a week and put it into a mutual fund, invest in long term, so you have something when it comes time to retire or to give it away. And here's the big, the, the, my final point in my book, by the way: you can't bless others, you can't build churches, you can't support missionaries, you can't. Build, put wells in Rwanda unless you have it to give away. And if you're just sitting on it like the one with the one talent dug a hole in the earth and did nothing with it, you're going to be held accountable. I think that's probably the, the most important thing you just said right there. And that is we're not 
investing, being biblically sound with our finances to multiply our money for our own benefit. That's true. We're doing it so that we can help others, so that we can be a blessing to others, which puts us in a position to really not just share the gospel verbally, but in, in demonstration. Uh, and, and I think that's a powerful thing. Richard, appreciate your time, appreciate your expertise. You're welcome. You guys out there, hopefully this has made you think a little bit and you want the easiest next step, well, it's just go get this book right there, How to Be a Great Investor. It's available now. And your investment in that book would be a good investment. So I encourage you to check that out. Hit share, hit follow. Join us again next week. We've got lots of great uh, interviews right here on Life Today Live. Next week, including, including two comedians next week and Mercy Me next Friday. So we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.